When you understand how harmony works, you start to understand everything. There is a mystery about the 9-11 attacks that mathematicians and statisticians have not been able to figure out. After counting all the people who had been evacuated, they calculated there should have been about 6,000 people left in the buildings when they collapsed. Yet for some inexplicable reason, there were only half. The mystery gets deeper. The airplane that struck the first building also had about half of the people it normally should have for that date and time. The mystery thickens. The airplane that struck the second building also had about half the people it normally should have. The mystery becomes more confounding because the airplane that struck the Pentagon also had about half of the people as well. And yes, you know where this is going. The fourth plane also had about half the people it normally should have. One plane having half the number of people could be explained by statistics if you relax the confidence intervals. However, two cannot. When you add the third and fourth plane and the number of people in the Twin Towers, the probability is so astronomically small, there is certainly something metaphysical happening here. They noticed the same phenomenon in the 1950s with passenger train wrecks, but nobody knew how or why. When they did the math, the probability was two in a billion for just the four planes. We commonly refer to this as zero, meaning there is no such reality that something beyond our physical understanding of the universe is happening here. There is clearly a stronger, more determinate, yet entirely invisible force at play regarding how many people remain live in a catastrophe. The mystery continues further when we look at death. One day I saw this article and it really intrigued me. It reported that in years of peace, there were sometimes more deaths in the military than in times of war. The U.S. government keeps excellent statistics about the death of U.S. soldiers, but this just seemed impossible. I was convinced someone did the math wrong or some shady statistics were afoot, so I dove into the hard data. Then I started analyzing the demographic and morbidity data from 1980 to date. I was looking at the death rates of men and women by age group in the military versus the civilian population. I was convinced I was missing something. My two-pronged thesis seemed completely logical to me that one, in peacetime, people in the military would have higher rates of dying than civilians because of the obviously more dangerous nature of the work. And two, the death rates would be higher in active wartime than in peacetime. I mean, it's active combat after all, right? So I crunched all the numbers and rechecked all the data, and it turns out I was wrong on both counts. My thesis was not only invalid, but when comparing the death rates of people in the military versus out of the military in times of peace and war, the morbidity was the same. As insane and as counterintuitive as that sounds, what this means is regarding death, according to this data set, in America for the past 40 years, it didn't seem to matter if you are in the military or out of the military, in active wartime or peacetime. There is a certain percentage of the population, for example in 1990 about 0.12% for 18 to 34 year olds, no matter what is going on, is going to die. Each age group and gender has its own correlative numbers, but the numbers are so close they're scary. And yes, the article is indeed correct. There are even times in peace where more people in the military die than war. The macro activity just didn't seem to correlate with deaths as you think it would. You know, yes, the numbers in the military and out of the military do trend upwards and downwards, but they do so in unison with the civilian population. There is clearly a stronger, more determinate, yet entirely invisible force at play regarding how many people die as well. According to Newtonian physical laws, the logical conclusion is that there is no logical conclusion. When a science becomes difficult to calculate, the majority of scientists just give up and call it an unexplained phenomenon and move on. Nonetheless, there appear to be metaphysical forces at play, meaning beyond the physical laws, because the numbers don't lie. The probability of these figures being randomly perfectly in sync over the past decades is one in trillions of trillions. And with modern data collection, we can actually survey what happened to the half of the people who missed their flights or were not in the Twin Towers and Pentagon. With the 9-11 attacks, it appears that if someone was in harmony with living, something would happen that would make sure that they wouldn't be on those flights, or something would keep them at home, or they would be late, or something else. 
we literally have thousands of data points confirming this is indeed exactly what happened. So here we have examples of both extremes, both in life and death, that there seems to be a certain percentage of the population that at any given time, in any given circumstance, is in harmony with living. And there is another data set that is also in harmony with dying. And even if they statistically should live or die, another force moves in or out of the way. So I started to put all this into a sort of theory about harmony. If my thesis on harmony works at the extremes of life and death, what about in between? It's often a mystery of who gets diseases and who doesn't. So if harmony applies to things like life and death, does it also apply to things like sickness and wellness? Well, let's find out. If my thesis is true, and people are in harmony with being ill and it's cured, another disease will slide in to take its place. Just like if you were in wartime and you were in active combat and in harmony with dying and peace broke out, death would still find you by another name like a car wreck or another accident. And if you worked in the Twin Towers and you were in harmony with living, some force would find a way to keep you alive, be it you took a vacation or you were late for work that day. But do we have any data about a significant amount of disease being cured in mass? Well, yes, in fact we do. In the early 20th century, modern society saw increased hygiene, faster herd immunity rates due to faster rates of travel, and vaccines start to wipe out infectious diseases. This is a perfect data set because if my theory is correct, if the masses were in harmony with disease and medicine found a cure for the specific diseases, yet the masses of people didn't change their harmony, they, in theory, would still get another disease. So let's look at the rates of infectious disease in the early 20th century and how it declined to almost nothing. So now here is the trillion dollar question. Did anything take its place? Well, yes, it did. Immune disorders went up in almost perfect correlation to infectious diseases going down. This left the medical community scratching their heads. Dr. Jenny Machalki, in her book Immunity, The Science of Staying Well, confirmed the link. The spectrum of disease faced by our immunity today has changed considerably from the infectious ones that challenged our health in the past. Germs may no longer be the enemy we face, but the war on our health is certainly not over. We have merely transformed it. So what's the data telling us? It seems that there is a sort of opportunistic and fatalistic phenomenon going on. That it doesn't seem to matter what we do mechanically about preventing deaths, accidents, or even sickness and disease. There, in essence, is a certain percentage of the population that is going to be affected by it. It doesn't seem to matter what actions are taken to prevent it. The essence still happens. We even have a common idiom for this phenomenon. Different places, same faces. Meaning if you move across a whole country and attempt to get away from jerks, the geographical place might be different, but the jerks are already there waiting for you. This reminded me about a clip from Pixar's Ice Age, where as soon as the character plugs one hole, another shoots out in its place. So it doesn't seem to matter if medical science figures out how to plug a new hole, because then it will just spurt out in another way. And you can see that with the current medical model. If my theory is true, the medical establishment, with its lack of understanding about harmony, is and forever will be just plugging holes. In fact, there's even an official term for it called whack-a-mole medicine. The underlying issue. Western medicine's admitted criticism is that they never address the cause. They only manage or mask profitable symptoms. Alternative or functional medicine practitioners attempt to go to a root cause, but even if they address it and cure it, they will sheepishly admit that the patient will still experience the essence of pain or disease in another way down the road. It's apparent that there is a true underlying issue beneath the physical root cause of illness. And my thesis is that it is harmonic in nature. The pain or disease can be thought of as a bitter fruit of a plant. The root can be thought of as the catalyst that appears to have started it all. But before the root, like an imbalanced diet, stress, or environmental toxins, there is an actual something that comes before the root. The seed. The seed is harmony. Thesis advancement. So my thesis of harmony scientifically and irrefutably works from everything from living to dying as well as sickness, disease, and wellness. 
It appears that everyone has certain amounts of harmony to those things which can be difficult if not impossible to measure. And all of scientific and medical data point to the same thing. The curative lies in changing harmony, not plugging the holes. Evidence of this harmony phenomenon is actually all over the traditional sciences with different names like self-fulfilling prophecy, self-defeating prophecy, Streisand effect, perverse results, victim mentality, cobra effect, placebo effect, nocebo effect, pygmalion effect, golem effect, perverse incentives, behavior confirmation effect, boomerang effect, and psychological resonance, just to name a few. And yet, I bet you see evidence of this in the lives of your friends, family, and even in your personal life. There are countless people who are eating right, exercising, meditating, yet still get major illness and disease. And there are countless other people who are eating poorly and never exercising, meditating, and remain disease-free. My thesis is, the determining factor is harmony. It's an unseen force that is difficult to define and impossible to numerically measure with existing technology. Let's define harmony as what someone thinks and feels about their body in relation to sickness, disease, and wellness. And I wonder, can we change our harmony? Being in harmony with your body. So what does that mean? People are in harmony, in essence, with their healthy or unhealthy bodies. In essence is sort of like the genre of music that a certain radio station plays. While all the specific songs are different, they all have a similar vein, kind of like all rock or classical. For example, if people are in harmony with a painful thing, genre, happening to their body, and they go to their practitioner to help them with painful problem X, and if they don't change their harmony about pain in their body, it's only a matter of time before a more painful problem Y is going to happen. If that is cured, then pain Z comes in, so on and so forth. That's being in harmony with painful things happening to one's body. Said in another way, if you're in harmony with mildly annoying or inconvenient things, genre, happening to your body, inspired practitioners can indeed help rebalance your body, but unless you change your harmony, more mildly annoying or inconvenient things are going to come into your existence, because that's what you are harmonically tuned to. After one classical song ends on the radio, it's not surprising that another classical song follows it, and more classical songs will endlessly play unless the station is changed. Well, that's an interesting theory, but is there any actual hard evidence for this in mainstream medical science? Well, let's look. Sigmund Freud is a household name and is considered to be the unquestioned father of psychoanalysis. What's never really mentioned is that he noted his patients might appear to be cured, but then soon after they would simply develop new symptoms. This happened again and again so frequently he actually coined this the symptom substitution phenomenon. But he didn't know what the cause was or meant. It's a classical music station analogy all over again. More recently, there was a doctor named John Sarno, who in 2012, Forbes magazine labeled him, quote, America's best doctor. He was a trained surgeon, but noticed that he never really cured or fixed any of his patients because their malady would just change to something else. Early in his career, Dr. Sarno would fix back problems, only to have them come back again with pain, just in a new area. Who knew something else was going on? He noticed this so frequently that he called this phenomenon the symptom imperative and further developed this theory hypothesizing that it was correlative to emotional trauma from childhood. He said that if you don't deal with the trauma, the body is going to recreate the pain to distract you from your past emotional pain. Quote, if the psyche has introduced a physical symptom, such as back pain, or an emotional symptom, such as depression, which is then temporarily relieved in some fashion without dealing with the underlying emotional dynamic, the psyche will simply create a symptom to take its place. This 100% confirms my thesis on harmony, and the proof is in the pudding. Besides being labeled America's best doctor, he had tens of thousands of cured patients and a wait list decades long. A 2017 book on pain treatments described Sarno as the rock star of the back world. A documentary on his life and work titled All the Rage, Saved by Sarno, was released in 2016. Notable patients of Sarno included radio personality Howard Stern, Tom Sharpling, comedian Larry David, actress Anne Bancroft, filmmaker Terry Zigoff, 2020 co-author John Stossel, television writer Janet Barber, 
and Sopranos actor Michael Imperioli, all of them and countless other praising Sarnos and his work. Howard Stern even dedicated his first book in part to Sarno. There isn't a single practitioner practicing medicine in all the world who hasn't noticed this phenomenon with clients firsthand. Quote, the symptom imperative tells us that by taking away the symptom by use of a placebo or antidepressant will only give rise to another symptom, and the other symptom might be related to something serious, like cancer. He continued to develop the symptom imperative theory, confirming that if you deal with the inner disharmonic factor, the pain stops, and it is never replaced with another pain or malady somewhere else. He taught his patients how to change their harmony. So in answering the question, can you change your harmony? Yes, it is possible. Some people are convinced their issue isn't an inner work or harmony problem because they have actual documented physical problems with their body. But there is a little secret in the chronic pain management world. Let's look at the three major groups of people regarding chronic pain. The first group consists of millions of people who have chronic pain and have medically documented herniated discs, spinal disc arthritis, and spinal disc spurring. However, in the second group of people, there is an equal number of millions who also have those same physical problems with the exact same medical documentations and yet zero pain. In The Great Pain Deception, Faulty Medical Advice is Making Us Worse, Dr. Stephen Ray Ozanik confirms that, quote, Physicians concentrate on MRI findings and often make faulty assumptions about the significance of them while ignoring the fact that many people with no pain have the exact same findings. And there is a third group where there are untold millions who have chronic pain and no medical documented causes. This group is growing the fastest. And I purport that it is not always the degraded physical manifestation that is the true cause. That's just the bitter fruit from the degraded harmony seed, which led to the degraded physical condition. If you fix the harmony, the medical documented pain goes away. We can be assured that these are harmonic problems. Disharmony can be the actual true cause of a long list of maladies in the human condition. If you talk to any seasoned practitioner, they will indeed confirm seeing this phenomenon in their medical practice, where it becomes a whack-a-mole with new problems that arise only after they've fixed another one. It seems to me personally that attempting to heal someone's present malady without helping them adjust their harmony violates the Hippocratic Oath of Do No Harm. Because all the science confirms that if my thesis about harmony is true, any attempts to alleviate someone's suffering Without dealing with the lack of harmony issue, the practitioner is knowingly but inadvertently ushering them into yet more future pain and suffering by another name, perhaps into other maladies that are potentially incurable. We have an idiom in English that says, better the devil you know than the devil you don't, meaning the problem you have right now could be better than the next unknown problem. If you don't stop and sit down and deal with your harmony, your problems with your body are just going to get bigger and worse until you have no choice but to stop looking outside yourself and start to adjust your harmony. Dr. John Sarno confirms, quote, In truth, American medicine has done enormous harm. It has misdiagnosed the cause of pain, guaranteeing that even if the patient experiences pain relief due to the placebo reaction, the pain will return to the same or some other location, or... Following the principle of the symptom imperative, another physical disorder will take its place. In no way has the patient been healed. The conclusion is inescapable that the psychology behind both the physical and affective emotional disorders is the same, and that people whose pain is replaced by anxiety or depression are also experiencing the symptom imperative. It follows that good medicine requires first acknowledging those unconscious emotions and then dealing with them. Treating anxiety or depression with medications without in-depth psychotherapy is poor medicine, and may even be dangerous if the symptom imperative leads to a serious disorder like one of the many autoimmune maladies or cancers. These are not fanciful conclusions based on conjecture. They are derived from irrefutable clinical experience. As Dr. Sarno points out, the issues that are causing an emotional response are the true seed of the problem. So let's talk about how harmony works. 
We can know if our thoughts about our body and health are in harmony with our emotions. Science confirms that emotions come after thoughts. Many people think their emotions cause thoughts, but what is happening is we can think and feel and think and feel and think and feel and think and feel, so it feels like our thoughts sometimes come after emotions. But let's just do a little test to prove it right now to ourselves what is the truth. What I want you to do right now is kind of make yourself angry. Keep your mind completely blank, but make a fist and say grr and stomp your feet aggressively and furrow your brow and breathe in short, fast breaths. Really try and get into it, but keep your mind blank. So, were you able to do it? Did you feel angry or did you kind of feel silly? Did it seem like you were just going through the motions and pretending to be angry? With no thought as a catalyst, you weren't able to hold on to any genuine anger for more than a passing moment. So now you've proven to yourself that indeed emotions respond to thoughts. Once you can change your thoughts, your new feeling will begin to emerge and you will have taken the first step in your road to personal freedom. So what happens to people's bodies that habitually think thoughts that are followed by negative emotion? One of the founders of psychosomatic medicine was Frank Gabriel Alexander that confirmed that, quote, everything medical is influenced in some ways by emotions. John Sarno adds, there are those in medicine who believe that emotions play a role in all aspects of health and illness. I am one of them. I believe that all medical studies are flawed if they do not consider the emotional factor. All. Wow, that's a pretty bold statement, but exact emotions are kind of challenging, but not impossible to measure, at least somewhat. With modern data and collection techniques, we can now study and correlate people, diseases, and their emotions. There, in fact, have been many credible longitudinal studies with tens of thousands of people correlating emotions and health. Just look at the legendary Hans Jürgen Eisnick. Hans Jürgen Eisnick was a German born psychologist who spent his professional career in Great Britain. He is best remembered for his work on psychology and how it related to intelligence and personality. At the time of his death, he was the living psychologist that was most frequently cited in peer-reviewed scientific medical literature. One of his studies lasted 20 years, and he analyzed more than 13,000 individuals who were healthy adults and ranged in age from 25 to 50. He used extensive psychometric testing to categorize individuals into four personality types that relate to their emotion or harmony and how that correlated to disease. In his article, Cancer, Personality, and Stress, Prediction, and Prevention, he clearly defined cancer-prone personalities. These are the four personalities he categorized people into. Type 1. Type 1 individuals have lifelong feelings of hopeless depression. Basically, they want to be nurtured, which probably began with a parent, but was transferred into adulthood by another individual who is not the least bit interested in a relationship or nurturing. These individuals feel hopelessly depressed because they can never receive the nurturing that they need. Over the next 20 years, roughly 75% of those who died of cancer had a type 1 personality. 15% had a type 2 personality, and 9% had a type 3 personality. Type 2. Type 2 individuals have been angry throughout life and have never been able to deal with their anger. Over the next 20 years, approximately 75% of those who died of heart disease had type 2 personality, and about 15% had a type 1 personality. Type 3. Type 3 individuals can't make up their minds. He often called them bi because they flip between depression and anger. Interestingly, however, this is healthier than either one of them alone. Type 3 individuals die only 7 years earlier than type 4, whereas type 1 individuals die approximately 35 years earlier than type 4. Type 4. Type 4 individuals are what he would call self-actualized. Eisnett called them autonomous. Basically, they say, you can't make me happy and you can't make me unhappy. I am responsible for my own happiness. Happiness is my business. They are in harmony with what their emotions are telling them. They believe they have the power within themselves to control their thoughts and thereby control their emotional indicators. Only 0.8% of type 4 individuals during the next 20 years died of cancer. Type 4 individuals live an average of 55 years longer than type 1. I guess we should all figure out how to be a type 4. <laughs> With a study this long, with that many people, by the number one most cited practitioner in all medical science, 
This unquestionably cements the fact that emotional states directly correlate with physical bodily health. Which is kind of funny to me because the official stance of the American medical establishment today says that emotions have no effect on physical health. Besides ignoring all the mountains of irrefutable scientific evidence, or even common sense, that dictates stress affects physical health and susceptibility to disease. Harmony at the very start. We've talked about harmony all the way up to death's door, but it can obviously affect everything from the very start. There was an accidental discovery of how harmony with food can affect our bodies. Within Western culture, it is universally accepted that glucose spikes from eating sweet things are bad for one's health. The spike promotes hunger, which leads to overeating, weight gain, diabetes, and all the diseases associated with that. However, when certain people ate a sugar-laden cookie, some did not have the expected spike in their glucose levels. Scientists tried to figure out why certain people's body didn't react the expected way. Not finding any physical markers or metrics, they eventually started talking to the participants. Long story short, they found out the people were not worried or stressed while eating a cookie. In layman's terms, they had made friends with food. They didn't have any negative thoughts that were surrounding the potential adverse side effects of eating cookies, and their body responded accordingly. This is not saying that some people could thrive on a diet entirely made of cookies, but that many of the adverse side effects seem to be mitigated by a more positive relationship with food. In like manner, it is similarly possible that negative environmental factors can be mitigated by a more positive philosophy and relationship with the environment. This again confirms my thesis of harmony. There are intangible factors that sway physical agents' impacts on the body, both positively and adversely. It turns out that specific actions, substances, or environmental factors are not the only factor relating to outcomes. Harmony is just as, if not, more important. Both are adjustable weights on the scale, one we have control over and one we do not. In Kelly Turner's excellent book, Radical Remission, she found out the remission of cancers was not in fact random nor spontaneous like the medical establishment claimed. There were consistent, measurable factors that correlated with those who experienced radical remission. She found nine factors that correlated to rapid, medical, and unexplainable disappearances of cancers. The majority, six of them, were intangible, philosophical shifts, not lifestyle nor diet changes. This further confirms again my thesis of harmony. Major philosophical shifts are requisite factors in healing. They change how they thought about their body and cancer. And I'm going to teach you how to do this today. Conclusion. Different places, same places, and whack-a-mole medicine. My thesis of harmony is indeed scientifically confirmed at every stage of life, death, health, and wellness. Harmony drastically changes the outcomes of our bodies from the very beginning of what we eat to the very late stages of cancer. The good news is we can adjust our harmony at any time on any subject. In the book The Molecules of Emotion, in the old reductionist model, chronic illness such as heart disease and cancer are seen as forces attacking the body, making us helpless victims incapable of response outside of high-tech medical treatments. But the concept of consciousness intervening adds a new element to the equation, a scientifically valued intelligence that can play an active role in the healing process. You know, at this point, I'm going to call my thesis the theory of harmony. We can say that if someone is in harmony with dying, and war is a major cause of death and peace breaks out, they are just going to die in another way. If someone is in harmony with death, trying to eliminate causes or symptoms won't work either. If someone is in harmony with health, and they are in the midst of a deadly pandemic and war, it doesn't matter. Nothing will fatalistically harm them. Changing harmony is what apparently matters most. Harmony does not only seem to be able to put a thumb on the scale, but it can totally override the balance of any positive or negative weights or inputs. The ramifications of this theory is going to cause an entire paradigm shift for all medicine. So does it even matter if biomedical science cures a specific cancer? No. Nor does it matter if they get a universal vaccine claiming to protect against all viruses. History and medical science show again and again that if you are in harmony with death, living or disease, you will still get death, continued life, or disease. 
it will just manifest itself by another name. Same face, different place. Does any of this sound intimately familiar? For you personally, do you resolve one malady only to have another one come take its place? Does it feel like whack-a-mole with your body's problems? As soon as you hit one down, another one pops up to take its place. This isn't about being fatalistic, but it's clear that it's time for a fundamentally new approach. It's time to learn how to change your harmony with your body. Caveat. This isn't about blame. It's about empowerment. Before we discuss this, I just want to add a word of caution regarding the dangers inherent in this topic. The danger is that what is discussed can come across as sounding as if those who still have their malady are in some ways defective or less than those who have achieved harmony. This is not true. It can also be frustrating that achieving harmony sounds too simplistic, especially when you are suffering. There is a limitation of words, and language can often do more harm than good. Anyone who doesn't heal themselves is still a powerful creator in their own life and a whole person. People also may have metaphysical reasons for their malady which are needed in their own personal journey and purpose for this life on this planet. I am certain that there will be those who disagree or are offended by the medical history and science behind harmony and how it relates to healing. That's okay. I'm only relaying this theory of harmony in the hopes that it may assist someone somewhere on their journey. Story time. Carl Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. There is a story that one day one of his clients, in discussing her problem, said, I sure hope I'm causing this problem. Baffled, Jung replied, why? And she explained, because if I'm doing this, I can undo it. Let's all be like her. See how wise she was? Admittedly, that takes an extremely high level of self-awareness, maturity, humility, personal integrity, and frankness that we should all strive for. But she understood that if she did it, she could undo it, and she was empowered. If she didn't do it, then she couldn't undo it, and she is powerless. This is all about one thing. Empowerment. Many healers say that all illness stems from forgetting who you are a powerful being. Quote, from the perspective of a healer, illness is a result of imbalance. Imbalance is a result of forgetting who you are. Barbara Brennan, Hands of Light. How to get into harmony with the essence of health and well-being. Even though you have been thinking roughly the same thoughts about your body for decades, it's not going to take decades to reverse. Yes, it may take a few hours, a day, a month, but you can do it. I'm going to teach you every step along the process, but you can't just follow along and parrot my words. This is your journey, and you need to change the way you've been thinking about your body in relation to health and wellness. I can't, and nobody can do this for you. Now let's discuss if your thoughts are in harmony or not with what you want. What emotion indicates how you think about your body? Let's look at this emotional scale. This is a hierarchy of emotions. At the very bottom are the worst feeling emotions and each emotion above it feels arguably better. At the very top are the best feeling emotional indicators, and what they indicate are levels of harmony with who you really are. At the top, this is your natural state. Your natural status is that of a healthy, happy person. This is you in complete harmony. I use the analogy of an electrical dimmer light switch, and at the top there is no resistance. The full flow of who you are is being allowed. Illness can't abide in this area. As soon as we apply resistance to the current, we start to get dimmer and less and less of who we really are. At the very bottom, we are in our most resistant state and letting in the least amount of light. Each level of resistance has a correlate of harmony. For example, terminal cancer would be in harmony with powerlessness, which is at the very bottom of the scale because you feel like you have no power. Stubbing one's toe would be in harmony with frustration for most people. Don't get caught up in the semantics. Words are just a signpost pointing to a concept or idea. Everyone can define emotions differently and that's okay. Rearrange them if desired based on your own experience. The guiding principle is to reach for thoughts that indicate a better feeling emotion. So let's see how this works on the emotional scale. At the very bottom is powerlessness because there is nothing worse than feeling powerless. Now I ask, would you rather feel anger or powerless? I know those aren't two very good choices, but you have to admit you'd rather feel anger. 
you have a little bit of your power back in anger that you don't have in powerless despair. How we use the scale is we slowly, step by step, work our thoughts up the scale to better and better thoughts. Because each thought has a specific level of harmony that goes with it. We can tell if it's better or worse with our emotions. Each step of this journey is about leaning towards better feeling thoughts. Not instantaneously trying to think the best thought we've ever had. Just progressively a little bit better. As in anger is better than depression. So the first question you ask yourself when you think about your specific health problem is how does this make you feel on the scale? See if you can identify where you are regarding your problem. And wherever you are is 100% okay. Does it make you frustrated, angry, depressed, powerless? Find out where you are. So side note, if your problem makes you feel frustrated, you have to admit that you've been feeling really frustrated in your life lately. Matchy matchy. This is harmony. You need to make this correlation going forward that you get the essence of what you think and feel about. Our emotions let us know if our thoughts are in harmony with what we want. When we feel negative emotions, this is telling us that if we don't change our thoughts, this is going to lead us down a path in which we will not like the destination when we get there. If our thoughts feel good, we will like the destination when we get there. And if we ignore these negative emotional indicators long enough, they will get bigger until you have a physical manifestation. What does it mean, I ignored it? Like I said, when anything comes into your life, you should first ask, how does this make me feel? If you find yourself thinking disharmonic thoughts, the first indication is negative emotions. This is your inner being indicating via negative emotions to get you to stop it. It's trying to tell you that this thought path you are on will lead you to a place you do not want to go. It's disharmonic. If you ignore it, don't worry, it'll get bigger, as in you will get stronger negative emotions. And if you ignore that, don't worry, it will get bigger. People will start to cut you off in traffic. If you ignore that, it'll get bigger. People will be rude to you. If you ignore that, it will get bigger and you're going to start to lose things. If you ignore that, you're maybe late to important meetings. If you ignore that, you're going to start to stub your toe. If you ignore that, you're going to drop and crack your phone. If you ignore that, don't worry, it'll get bigger, you'll get into fender benders. If you ignore that, don't worry, it'll get bigger, and you're going to break your leg or have some other physical manifestation that is going to force you to stop and reflect. This may be why you are here watching this video today. Going forward, you just need to be aware of what your thoughts and your emotions are trying to guide you towards and away from. All of your senses help you get to where you want to be. Your emotions have often been called your sixth sense. And they are going to be doing exactly the same thing as all your other senses are doing as well. Helping you get to where you want to be. So let's get back to explaining how to move up the emotional scale. Now remember, I can't just sit here and have you follow along. You have to do the work yourself. Here is an example of someone going from the very bottom of the scale all the way to the very top. You may not be at the very bottom of the scale with your problems, so you don't have to always start at the bottom. Start from where you are. Now, the goal is to move up to the top of the scale where you think about your problem or body and you receive a positive emotional response, like knowing and joy. But where you are now, you literally can't. So how do we get to the top? Well, here's the key. You have to go up the scale one step at a time. We can't just reach for joy, knowledge, and bliss. Have you ever been angry or depressed about something and someone says, well, you should be happy? Don't you just kind of want to punch them in the face? It's exactly like going up the stairs. Trying to jump from the bottom to the top is a physical impossibility. And trying to go from powerless to bliss is similarly impossible. It's just too much too fast. Like an old analog radio, you have to move the dial through all the radio stations in the middle to get to the other side. So let's say you've been feeling powerless about your health problem. Nothing seems to be working. You feel like you've went to countless doctors and practitioners. You've tried every supplement. You've searched and tried all kinds of things. You feel powerless. So what's the next logical step up from powerlessness? Yep, anger, blame, and revenge. So I want to give yourself permission to think spiritually and socially inappropriate things. Let yourself be angry. Vengeful thoughts about your problem. You may want to write this down, as in writing you have the most clarity. Nonetheless, start blaming others in your mind. 
Blame Western medicine. Blame the hospitals. Blame safety food regulators. Blame polluters. You are going to first notice that in anger and blame, you have a little bit of your power back. You're going to feel a little better. Now, we're not going to act on this, but let yourself go there in the mind, at least temporarily. Grant yourself permission to entertain these thoughts of anger, revenge, and blame. Why does Western medicine have to be profit-based? Why is there so much fraud? Why do they put known toxins in our food? Why does the food industry buy off politicians? I'm going to sue them with a class action lawsuit. I'm going to force them to consume their own toxins. Let's jail the politicians that made it happen. You will feel the energy moving. You will start to feel better, even enjoy it. Notice how you can breathe easier now. This is indicating that you are indeed one step closer to who you really are. Again, don't act on this. But you can do in an hour or a day or a month what therapists can't do in decades because they condemn thoughts of anger and revenge as wrong instead of a step in the right direction. Do you remember the people from Hans's study? They did this type of cycling between anger and depression and it didn't serve them well. So take as long as you wish. Wait until all that energy sort of peters out. You will feel when there is a lull in your thoughts. Now it's time to reach for a little better feeling thoughts. Reach for thoughts like impatience, irritation, and frustration. Think about why this illness isn't healing faster. Think of how inconvenient it is to deal with this. Think about how much money you've had to spend on this issue. Think about all the driving time and research you've burned up trying to figure this out. Be irritated that you have to take time out of your life to deal with these issues. At this point on the emotional scale, you can go either way. You can go back down to anger, so be careful to lean towards a better feeling thought that's higher on the emotional scale. Once all this frustrated energy dissipates, you're going to find that similar lull again. Now this is very good because now you are at a tipping point. This is where you really start to gain harmony with what you want in your body. Let's continue and move up the scale to hope. Hopeful thoughts may be like, you know, it is true that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. This isn't affecting every waking hour of my life. I will find something that works for me. I know there are others who have been where I am now who have found a way that works for them. I know some things will help. I am taking control of my experience. I can figure this out. I've learned about harmony and this does make sense. With this knowledge, I think I can solve this. I do feel more hopeful after watching this video than I did before. I know others have recovered from this problem, and even worse, so can I. Solutions to problems do come to me. I even rendezvoused with this information I'm listening to right now. I've always known there is a mental component to healing. I think I'm getting this information well. I've never really learned about this topic at any doctor's office quite like this before. I think these people know what they're talking about. I know how powerful the mind is. My body is miraculous and its ability to repair and rebalance. Just keep reaching for slightly better feeling thoughts. Soon enough, you're going to tap into a knowing that you're going to be okay and you're going to solve this. You know, I think I found the right place for me. I know the power of mind is the biggest component of healing. I'm happy I've learned how to best direct my thoughts. I'm going to be able to help a lot of people with this information and the story of my healing. I can do this. I can heal this. This is going to be fun. I've got this. I'm looking forward to making this change. I like feeling good. I like feeling good about my body. I feel good about my body. Soon enough, your thoughts will send your emotions soaring, and this is where you need to be. And now you need to habituate these great feeling thoughts. You cannot just use happy sounding words, but you actually need to reach a breaking point where you are no longer worried about this problem in your body and you genuinely start to think better about your body 51% of the time. You have to tip the scales. If you can't feel good about thinking about your malady, then don't think about it. Because your thoughts are like a garden with your attention being the hose. Whenever you think about something, you're watering it, be it your aches and pains or vibrant health. Whatever you focus on expands in your own experiential awareness. If you can't think thoughts that give you a positive emotional indicator, then do not think about it. Think about other topics that do give you a positive emotional indicator. Again, unfortunately, this is a solo journey that only you can take. There aren't magical words, treatments, acupressure points, stances, breathing techniques, or protocols we can use to change your harmony for you. 
Nobody can think thoughts for you, and therefore nobody can harmonize you to anything except you. They may be able to influence you to think those thoughts, but those thoughts must originate from you unprompted. You have to do the work. Nobody can make you think any thought without your willingness to entertain it. Neurologist, psychiatrist, philosopher, and author Viktor Frankl was in the Nazi concentration camps, and he learned that the guards could make him do anything except for one thing he had unchallengeable and absolute power over, and that was his ability to think whatever thoughts he wanted to. Maybe you feel your situation is more difficult than his, and that you just can't think a better thought, but I promise you, that your ability to choose your thoughts is the one thing that you have absolute 100% power over. Regarding your specific problem, every thought is where you last left it, so as long as you don't go down the emotional scale, you should be good. You might need to work yourself up the emotional scale every single day for a month, but once your emotions are soaring, at this point, things really start to move because there is a huge side effect of achieving this harmonic place about your malady or body. Your journey may not be over yet, but now you are on the right track and path towards healing. And this path is the shortest, fastest path towards healing. So now that you've tuned in and started to harmonize with a better feeling body, you will now start hearing the broadcast that is inspiration. The Side Effect of Changing Your Harmony When you feel better about your body and life, you start to harmonize with things that are in harmony with all things that match a better-feeling body coming into your life. Remember America's best doctor, John Sarno? He was convinced that the body keeps manifesting problems until we deal with the seed problem, which is some sort of traumatic event in your past, that when you think about it, you will receive a negative emotional response. What's amazing is that millions of people just reading his book and connecting their current pains with past trauma was enough to have the pains permanently go away. And you, in learning about harmonic theory, may identically be healed as well. However, you may need an inspired practitioner protocol or another change in your life to help clear this out. And this is where one of the best things about harmony comes into play. Since you have found harmony with being whole and healthy, now information that is in harmony with your wholeness and healthiness will come across your path. For example, just like our radio analogy, once you tune in, you will hear lots of different songs, but they will all be the same genre. So when you tune in to your body being whole, now lots of different information that support you in your healing journey will come to you in synchronistic ways. The perfect books, articles, documentaries, supplements, protocols, and inspired healers will start to cross your path in a synchronistic way to help you along the way to your new vision of yourself. Because they match your harmony. Everything will feel like the next logical step. Don't think that just moving up the emotional scale will fix everything. While that may indeed be true, it's often about harmonizing with the exact best, fastest tools and protocols to help you along the way. The right path is the inspired path. Is the theory of harmony toxic positivity? While reaching for thoughts that give you the positive emotional indicator of harmony and joy, we need to remind you that this isn't about being positive all the time. Happy sounding words don't count or help. In fact, inauthentic words hinder the harmonizing process. You can't fake a blissful feeling or any feelings. The genuine thoughts need to come first. Faking it is toxic positivity, and that isn't helpful at all. Remember, you don't get what you feel positive about. You get what you are in harmony with. You didn't get your malady because you felt positive about it. You got it because you were in harmony with it. Trying to be positive when you are on the lower end of the emotional scale is toxic positivity, and it is not helping at all. Proof Positive The perfect example of harmony is Anita Morgiani, who admits that her constant fear of cancer harmonized her with cancer. When two people she knew were both diagnosed with cancer, she relayed this story in her excellent, highly recommended book, Sensitive is the New Strong. This news anchored the fear deep in me because both of these people were close to my age. I began researching everything I could about cancer and its causes. Initially, I started doing this in the hopes of helping. I wanted to be there for Sony and help her in her fight. 
But I found out the more I read about dis-ease, the more I was afraid of everything that could potentially cause it. I started to believe that everything created cancer, pesticides, microwaves, preservatives, genetically modified foods, sunshine, air pollution, plastic food containers, mobile phones. This obsession progressed until eventually I started to fear life itself. They were going through full treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, stem cell, everything, and it didn't seem to get them any better. It increased my fear. I feared the treatment of cancer. I feared death. I wanted to do everything I could to avoid cancer. Everything I did was driven from a place of not wanting the dis-ease. My research broadened to include how to avoid cancer. I purchased all the supplements that were antioxidants and anti-cancer. Curcumin, CoQ10, Omega-3, Chlorella, Vitamin C, Green Tea Extract. I took boatloads of supplements every day. I grew my own wheatgrass so I could take fresh wheatgrass shots every morning. I made super green smoothies and started to follow an anti-cancer diet, collard greens, kale, lentils, and lots of raw food. Back then I was obsessed. I changed my whole diet depending on the latest article I've read in the new findings. I installed reverse osmosis water system. We measured our electromagnetic readings to determine if we needed to make any drastic changes in our environment. I was determined that I wasn't going to get cancer because I was so vigilant in fighting against the illness. If I missed a dose of my gazillion supplements, I felt incredibly fearful and would make up for it by being even more vigilant. I was exhausted from my self-prescribed protocol. Working extremely hard every day, I'd keep cancer away. My focus was completely on cancer. And you know what happened? I got cancer. This shows that what you are in harmony with trumps action, so working on your harmony must be priority number one. It's more important than anything else because it has to be a bigger weight on the scale than everything else. If you are trying to improve your health but aren't working on your harmony, it doesn't matter what path you take, it won't get you to where you want to be. So if two people have identical bodies and take identical action and one of them thrives and one of them become riddled with disease, it's clear that it's not about action. It's about harmony. You can do the right action, but without harmony, it will fail. You can do the wrong action, and with harmony, it will succeed. To finish Anita's story, the cancer shut down all her organs and she went into a coma where she had a near-death experience where she learned to change her harmony about her body. She realized who she really was and came back. All her organs started working again and within a week all the cancer that riddled her entire body disappeared and the doctors couldn't find any trace or any disease in her. That is the power of harmony because harmony is the determining factor, not action. Remember, everything in the entire universe is about harmony. That doesn't leave much else out, including your malady. I highly recommend everyone read Anita Morgiani's books, especially her first one, Dying to Be Me. A link is below. Fatalism and Optimism You know, I wonder what is the efficacy of action if you are still in harmony with sickness or pain? All of the medical history and all of medical science shows that you can get every vaccine and booster, wear multiple masks, social distance, and run far, far, far away from all humans. And if you are in harmony with illness, you're still going to get sick. Illness will find you. For example, there are countless bacteria like tuberculosis that can be encapsulated by the immune system in lung tissue in a wall of various immune cells and do no damage for months, years, decades, even an entire lifetime. And it does this for about 95% of people. Until the immune system is stressed to a point where it can no longer keep the bacteria in check, it releases it to damage the lung tissue and spread to the rest of the body. Taking dramatic action from a place of fear is a surefire recipe for disease or countless other unwanted experiences to flourish. This isn't about being fatalistic because the law works both ways. It's a two-way street and the opposite also may be true as well. If you are in harmony with wellness, you can have zero vaccines, wear no masks, and literally be surrounded by disease that cannot fatalistically harm you. And this is the point of harmony. This isn't saying that one should never wear their seatbelt or wash their hands after touching something that was diseased. It's saying never take action from an emotional feeling place of lack. 
because once you get in harmony with what you want, your actions will be made from a place of inspiration and connection instead of from fear and lack. From a place of security and knowing of your well-being, you may indeed be inspired to take a supplement, change your diet, wear a mask, wash your hands, or, or, or. Practitioners in the Theory of Harmony I'm not saying that inspired practitioners and other medical researchers should stop practicing or creating new healing protocols. Far from it. Their inspired protocols provide a sort of temporary get-out-of-disease-or-pain-free card that affords people the luxury of working on themselves and our body's harmony with wellness. But work on harmony first. If your practitioner doesn't understand harmony, then you need to do it yourself. Because if you don't, there may be a time when medical science runs out of of get-out-of-disease-or-pain-free cards for you personally. And then you may be stuck with an idiopathic, chronic, or incurable illness in which it may be more difficult to change your harmony, even though it's always possible, no matter where you stand. There are countless new diagnostic tools, new breakthrough medicines, supplements, inspired protocols, and energy workers. But it doesn't matter if you go to countless clinics and do everything to the letter that the inspired practitioner tells you to. If you haven't sat down and done the work to change your relationship with your body's harmony, your relief will only be temporary and transitory. You will just change out one problem for a new one. Nobody, not even an inspired practitioner, can force you to think the right thoughts for yourself, thereby adjusting your harmony. You have to do it yourself. Conclusion In the early 20th century, they said they were on the cusp of a medical revolution and the majority of diseases and maladies were going to be eradicated with vaccines and other medical advancements. And they were right. But they didn't teach people how to change their harmony, so other worse diseases took their place. And in the early 21st century, they said they're on the cusp of yet another claimed medical revolution, and the majority of diseases and maladies are going to be eradicated with stem cells, CRISPR, and other medical advancements. And I bet they are indeed, again, going to be correct, but because they still haven't taught people how to adjust their harmony, as history repeats itself, other problems are just going to take their place. Eventually, they won't be able to diagnose or find the problem. And this is exactly what is happening with the chronic pain and idiopathic illness pandemic. We now have an outbreak of illness caused by unknown reasons. Medical science calls this idiopathic illness, and sure enough, look at the instances of idiopathic illness in the medical journals. They're skyrocketing. You know, I'm sitting here digesting all this information, and I'm pondering, what is the use of trying any protocol if I haven't done the harmony work first? For me personally, if I had a health problem, and I knew I hadn't stopped and sat down and really worked on my harmony, would I personally ever participate in any therapy? No, not in a million years, no matter how promising or effective it was. Because even if there was a 100% probability I would be cured, the theory of harmony and all medical history points to the same thing. My lack of harmony would just cause another malady to manifest itself in another way, possibly something worse, or maybe something with no known cure. And the devil I know may be better than the devil I don't. So often, an inspired practitioner comes up with a prolific and inspired healing protocol that heals a formerly incurable malady. And they meet with great success, even fame. But if the patient doesn't change their harmony, and while indeed their current problem disappears, what you never see or hear about is a new problem under a different diagnosis or unknown name comes back into their life. You've got to change your harmony first. And I'm guessing you don't need to study science because you've already had enough first-hand evidence in your life. And I bet you've seen this in the life of your friends and family. It just seems like one thing after another. It seems like there's always another problem popping up just like whack-a-mole. And you can see now that it was because of what they were in harmony with. And still, science can't numerically measure harmony. Emotions are too hard to measure with existing technology, but just because something isn't easily measured doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Germs also didn't exist, according to medical science, before the microscope. But we don't really need any medical device that can measure our harmony because that's exactly what emotions are. Sure, you can see emotional harmonic evidence all over the place, with different names like I mentioned before. 
But what could be more simple and accessible than emotions? The path to healing is already built in you. Good means good. Better feelings closer to who you really are. Negative emotions indicate further from who you really are and where you want to go. In fact, there's so much overwhelming evidence and so little statistical probability that it's wrong. I'm going to be bold and change this from my theory of harmony to the law of harmony. When you understand harmony, you start to understand everything. Money, relationships, health. And since it's a law, you can apply the same, raising your thoughts on all topics. But those are subjects for another video. Good luck on your healing journey.